Well, hello there. My name is Christopher Scott, and I serve as a small groups pastor of a local church, which is where I'm at right now, actually filming this video. And in this video, I want to give you 10 essential strategies for facilitating great small group discussions. As I work with all small group facilitators, I always try to give them a training a couple times a year and cover some really good, solid, basic facilitator tips and strategies. And this time I wanna give you 10 essential strategies every small group facilitator needs to know and needs to use to do a good group and have healthy small group uh, discussions. So first one I wanna talk to you about, number one, is keep a good study Bible nearby. Keep a good study Bible nearby. Uh, so you might want to have that good study Bible nearby so you can reference it as you're going through the discussion and talking through it. I was visiting one of our groups recently, uh, and they were reading the book of 1 Thessalonians. Uh, they had read through the entire book, and then they were just talking about the, the book and what they were learning and things like that. And one guy pointed out a verse in Thessalonians that says, Be quiet and live a quiet, simple life. And the guy was asking, what does that mean? So the facilitator, he has a good study Bible in front of him. He looks at the verse, he goes down to the bottom, he looks at the footnote, and he reads the footnote and gave a really helpful explanation for what that verse meant in the context and to the people in Thessalonica and to the issues that the people were going through. So you want to keep a good study Bible nearby. But what are some of the good features of a study Bible? Why would you want to have it? I mentioned the footnotes like that, but study Bibles also provide great introductions to books of the Bible. They're going to talk about who the author of the book was, who the letter is being written to or the book was being written to. They're going to give you some key themes for the book, each book of the Bible, a key verse, key chapters, things like that. They're going to give you an outline for the book and just provide some really good broad overview as you come to books of the Bible and study those in your group. So that's one of the benefits. Another one is the scripture study notes that I referenced above. Any good study Bible is going to have some footnotes at the bottom that gives a commentary on key verses and key phrase. And each footnote usually goes through uh, what's kind of a basic, how would you say it, a basic commentary of the entire verse. And then also it will give a commentary and study notes on specific words in that verse. So for example, I looked up in the ESV study Bible, verse, uh, what was it? It was Romans 6.23, which says, For the wages of sin is death, but the free gift of God is eternal life in Christ Jesus our Lord. And if you look down at the study notes, it comments on the entire verse. It says, those who give themselves to sin will die both physically and eternally, whereas Christians are assured of eternal life. Then the note continues on and it comments on that word wages in the ESV text. It says wages implies that the punishment for sin is what one has earned and one and who one deserves. Free gift, then it comments, so wages and also commenting on the two verses, free gift, is the opposite of something one deserves, which fits Paul's earlier emphasis on justification by grace alone. Then they reference some more passages from the book of Romans, Paul talking about that. So that's probably going to be the most helpful part of a study Bible as you facilitate a small group are those footnotes. A good study Bible also is going to have what is called a concordance, okay? Concordance. It's not really a word we ever use except in a church context, in a Bible context. And a concordance is something that's at the back of the Bible that lists the occurrences of specific words. So someone in your group might say, what does the Bible say about hate? You can flip your study Bible open to the back, find the, the section on H, look for hate, and it will list some of the times the word hate hate is used in the Bible, okay? And a study Bible isn't going to have every single example of hate. You need to buy a concordance, an exhaustive concordance, and that will have them, and those are usually 20 to $50, and they're about this thick. But a study Bible has a good one that you can do plenty of good study from with that concordance, okay? Then there's cross-references that study Bibles usually have too. Usually it's uh, in the center column, or the cross-references, or at the bottom um, of the page before the study notes are the cross references that will take you to other parts of the Bible um, that talk about the same words or ideas or people. So if you're in chapter 13 of Revelation and it's talking about this beast of the sea and this antichrist, 
there's going to be some cross references back to First Thessalonians and Second Thessalonians. Uh, so, I'm sorry, Second Thessalonians talking about that Antichrist and giving more descriptions. So those cross references will help you if you're struggling with a specific verse or passage. Um, or if you're in the Old Testament, sometimes events in the Old Testament um, are described um, in the book of Jeremiah, as well as, you know, Second Kings, as well as Second Chronicles. And so that will help you find parallel passages to describe that. So I've given you lots of good reasons to have a study Bible and how they're helpful. What are some good study Bibles? So the best study Bibles, in my opinion, uh, the best one, in my opinion, is the ESV study Bible. It is the most... Um, complete and exhaustive and it's got the most study materials you get the most bang for your buck with the ESV study Bible English Standard Version um, however it is big and the print is really small but you get the most for your money I also like to encourage people to use the NIV study Bible as well as the NLT study Bible I'll put links to all these down below on Amazon they are affiliate links so if you click on one of those Bibles and buy something from Amazon I do get a small commission just so you know so the ESV study Bible NIV study Bible NLT study Bible are th three great ones and those are kind of generic study Bibles and then there's certain Bible teachers that have created their own study Bibles over the years the Schofield reference Bible is probably the original study Bible that's a good one it comes in the King James New King James NIV I also like the Charles Ryrie, Ryrie Study Bible, that comes in the NASB, I think in the King James Version as well, and you can find some older versions in the ESV. So the Ryrie Study Bible is a good one as well. I like the Swindoll Study Bible, is in the NLT, Swindoll, Charles Swindoll, and then the David Jeremiah Study Bible is excellent also. Uh, so that comes in the NIV, the New King James Version, and the ESV, I believe. So you got a lot of options. Um, the best thing to do is go to a Bible bookstore, check them all out, uh, put them all out there, see what you like and what makes sense to you. And the best Bible to get is the Bible that you use, okay? So if you like the ESV translation, get that. If you like the NLT, get one of those. The best study Bible to use is a study Bible you're gonna use. So find one that works for you and that reads well and that you like and that is helpful for you. So those are just some of the ones I like. I'll put the references down there in the description and you can find one there on your own. So get a study Bible, keep it nearby and use it for reference when you facilitate small groups. You will be thankful you do and you'll find it helpful as well as your group finds it helpful. So the second essential strategy for facilitating a great discussion is to follow the 25% rule. What's the 25% rule? About uh, two years ago, I did some evaluation of our small groups at our church, and half of our small groups had four or less people in them, which is okay because the groups are small and people get lots of time to talk, but that led me to develop the 25% rule for the facilitators, meaning you as a facilitator need to talk 25% of the time for less in your group. And as the group grows, you as a facilitator talk less. So if there's four people in the group, you as a facilitator talk 25% of the time. If there's 10 people in the group, try to shoot for talking 10% of the time. And remember the goal is to get them discussing and talking about your study and what you're going through, not necessarily for you to be the one teaching and preaching. And as we talk about life groups at our church, L-I-F-E, that L stands for learning, instilling the Word of God. And we do that in three ways at our church. One is through Accord, by encouraging the groups to do the unifying question each and every week, asking, what did you learn from the message at church on Sunday? What did you take away from it? What did you learn? What stood out to you? What have you applied since then to your life? The second one is accuracy. We want people to have a very... Um, careful interpretation of the Bible, which is why we like to use good curriculum, why I like to give you all some good commentaries to help you as you study passages or come to the difficult sections, a good you know, Warren Wearsby commentary or Chip Ingram study that has some good teaching through it, things like that, that will help you go through it. And lastly, we want the L for learning to mean that people are applying what they are learning to their lives, okay? So that's what we want people to be doing in our groups is learning. Um, instilling the Word of God through accord, accuracy, and application, and you do that by helping people walk through the passage, relying on that study guide material you have, 
and encouraging them to try to apply what they're learning. And you need to remember that you as a facilitator are a facilitator. You're not the preacher, teacher, or the expert. And over time, people will start to learn. They'll learn, hey, this guy's prepared or this gal is prepared. She knows her stuff. They'll start to see you as a little bit of an expert, but it's always okay to remember, I'm just a participant like you um, and that I'm you know, learning and growing as we go along. And it's okay to say, I don't know. Um, so you're just a facilitator. You're not the expert you know, Jedi master in any way like that. You're just the facilitator. And I try to give you some tools, if you do a group with us, I try to give our facilitators the tools that will help them, such as our church's statement of faith that covers some basic things that everybody needs to agree on. Try to give them a good commentary by Warren Wearsby on the passage they're going through. There's a ladies group that's going through the book of Acts right now, and they've had to use the Warren Wearsby commentary to kind of help them as they come to some difficult passages and difficult, um, difficult interpretive issues that are talked about in Acts. And also a good study Bible is something you need to have that I've already talked about earlier in uh, this video about what you need. So a facilitator facilitates a discussion. You don't preach, you don't teach, you facilitate a discussion and do that by following the 25% rule. The third essential strategy for facilitating a great discussion is to use the notes in the back of your study guide. Not all the curriculum that we use or that you might use has notes in the back, uh, but one of the reasons I like to our church to sometimes use the Chip Ingram study guides is it's got some great DVD-based teaching. It's kind of like a 15 or 20 minute sermon, real short but direct, and some good studies and applications and discussion questions and homework that the people do. But in the back here, they give you session notes that helps you as a facilitator facilitate the discussion. In the session notes, they'll tell you, hey, look out for this, or hey, some people might have had this bad experience and this is gonna be difficult for them. If it's an eight week study, you come to the fifth week, they give you a little reminder, hey, ask everybody to think of some ideas for the next study and have them that, you know, text you their ideas so you can order the next study. Basic helpful tips like that. And it's a good strategy as a facilitator just to read those notes. They're put in the back of the study guides to help you and assist you and to make your life easier. And it's easy to get busy and, and not really prepare, but what you wanna do is read those notes each and every week, highlight them, underline them, and reference them so you can facilitate great discussions and lead a healthy small group. The fourth strategy for facilitating a great discussion is to watch how-to videos for your specific study. So this is something I do uh, for a lot of the studies that our church does. If they're going through books of the Bible like Acts or Romans or things like that, if they're doing a divorce care or grief share, if they're doing a topical study from Chip Ingram, if they're doing finances or things like that, I try to create a specific video for that study to help you as a facilitator. And I got a bunch of those. Um, you can find links in this YouTube channel of things I've created, uh, but that's something you can watch that I've created, or you can just simply go to YouTube, Google, you know, Rick Warren, 40 days of fasting study. And there'll be some, probably some tips on there that other people have done. Use those. These are people that have done the study before. They've experienced it. They know what to look out for. They can give you some helpful tips. So if you're one of the people that's part of our church, I encourage you, watch those videos I create for you. They're specific for you to help you and assist you to lead a good, healthy, small group. Silence is okay in your small group. That is the fifth tip I wanna to talk to you about. The fifth tip, fifth essential strategy for facilitating a great discussion is that silence is okay in your small group, okay? Silence is okay. You've spent a lot of time preparing for your group. You've read the passage. You've read your study guide. You've read some commentaries. You're ready to facilitate a great discussion. You get to the group. You read the passage out loud with everybody. You ask your question, and nobody says anything. But silence is okay in your small group. And I want to tell you why silence is okay, what not to do with silence, and what to do with silence. Okay, so why silence is okay. There's several reasons people might be silent and not answer your question when you ask it. Number one, they might not have understood what you asked, which is okay, especially if they haven't read the questions beforehand coming to the group. They might not have understood what you asked. Number two, 
You might have some newer people to your group that aren't really comfortable speaking up and talking quite yet, so they're just there checking it out. Another reason is that might be a personal question, and some people are kind of hesitant to share some personal things, right? And we live in a culture now where people are often really quick to talk about the sports and the weather and uh, politics and national debt and all the problems going on. But when it comes to our own lives, we're a little less forthcoming with things that we're doing in our lives, okay? Another thing is you might ask your question and everybody knows it's a great question, so they want to make sure they give a good answer. Or they might have an answer and they're not sure if it's correct and they don't want to say something wrong. So those are some various reasons people might be silent. It's not because they don't want to share. They just have some reasons they might be silent and, and don't share because of that. So what not to do with silence? What do you not want to do when people don't speak up when you ask a question? Number one, you don't want to answer the question yourself. This is the easiest thing to do because it fills that silence. But you don't want to answer it yourself because when you do, you're telling the group it's okay for them to be silent. You're just going to fill that time up. Furthermore, you're the facilitator. And if you start answering the question first, it kind of cuts them off from sharing because they feel like, well, you're the expert. You're the one leading the group. I guess you've said everything there is to say. And maybe we'll just move on. So don't answer the question yourself. Second, don't call on someone to answer the question. Don't call on someone to answer the question. And that's sometimes hesitant, you know, something we want to do too. We can just call on somebody and make them talk, but don't call on someone to answer the question. We want our groups to be a safe place where people can come, share their struggles and talk about things going on as they are ready and as they feel able. We don't want to force them to share. So don't answer the question yourself and don't call on someone to, act, to answer it. And there's an exception to that one, don't call on someone. If someone's in your group talking and they keep getting cutting off, getting cut off, it's okay to call on that person. Or if the person looks like they have a question they want to share but they're not speaking up, they look confused, it's okay to call on them. Um, but for this example, when it's quiet, you don't want to call on someone. So what do you do with that silence? What do you do with that silence? First thing is let it be. Just let it sit there. It'll, it might be 10 seconds, it will feel like an hour, but just let it be, that's okay. Second thing you wanna do with silence, ask the question again. They might not have understood it, maybe their phone buzzed in their pocket and they were dis distracted, maybe they weren't quite sure, so ask it again or rephrase it slightly in a better way, maybe it's something you can do. And then a the last thing you can do with the silence is just move on to the next question. Just skip it. If nobody has anything to say, just skip the question and go on to another one. Most of the study guides that uh, small groups use have plenty of discussion questions in them, often too many to cover in a meeting, so it's okay to skip it. So don't talk when other people should be talking. So silence is okay in your small group. That's the fifth strategy for facilitating great discussions is that silence is okay. The essential strategy number six for facilitating great discussions is you want to put the chairs or couches in a circle, right? When people come to some place and everything's in rows, right? Chairs are in rows or tables are in rows. It fosters a teaching environment. You put them in circles. It tells people it's time to talk and time to discuss. So you want to put the chairs, put the couches, whatever it might be, Put them in a circle so everybody can see each other. And maybe your group is using a DVD-based curriculum, so you have a TV. So put them all in a U facing the TV. Then once the DVD is done playing, you as a facilitator take a chair and put it right where that TV is. That way you can look at everybody. So ensure people have a good spot to sit in. Put them in circles so that they can talk and focus on each other. And if you have a new person that's coming to the group, they're naturally going to want to kind of sit on the outside or they might go sit over there. You know, welcome them to the group. Make sure they have a good seat right in the group where they can talk and discuss. Make sure that, you know, that's their seat they can sit in. They're going to feel embarrassed that they might be taking someone's seat. You just, you give them permission to go ahead and sit there. So put the chairs in a circle or U form around the TV so everybody can face each other and talk. That's the essential strategy number six for facilitating a great small group discussion. Essential strategy number seven for facilitating a great discussion 
is to start and end your group on time. You want to start and end your group on time according to that guy right there. Follow it. John Calvin was one of the reformers along with Martin Luther, was a contemporary to the reformer Martin Luther. Calvin's a little bit younger um, than he is. And so uh, he was in the city of Geneva. He had political influence and he created this thing called the consistatore, which meant people were uh, worshiping crucifixes and chalices and these things were kind of becoming idols. So Calvin got rid of all of those things, but he allowed the guys that made clocks to stay because according to Calvin, time was sacred and people would have to give an account to God eventually for every moment of their lives and how they used it to glorify God. And as a small group facilitator, you need to begin and end on time and be punctual with your group. Starting and ending on time is your responsibility as a facilitator. In the Psalms, David wrote, Lord, remind me of how brief my time on earth will be. Remind me that my days are number, how fleeting my life is. You have made my life no longer than the width of my hand. My entire lifetime is just a moment to you. At best, each of us is just a breath. There's a lady I was talking to at my other job recently, and she was showing me a picture. I was talking about my child, who's one or two right now, one and a half. And then she was talking about her daughter, who is just graduating from college. And she shows me this picture of her daughter in college and says, don't blink, right? It, it happens fast and goes fast. In Ephesians, Paul writes, make the most of every opportunity. And that's something as facilitator you need to do in your group. Start on time and end on time. But why? Why should you start and end on time? First, it causes people to show up on time. If you regularly start on time, people will show up on time. If you start regularly not starting on time, people will stop showing up on time. It's pretty much that simple. Some people need structure in their group. I'm one of those people. If you just, you know, kind of show up and wing it and go with the flow, I ain't sticking around. I want to be there on time, start on time, end on time, and have some good structure to it. Okay? That's just how some people are. It keeps your conversation focused as well, right? When you start on time and end on time, it helps people stay focused and stay um, on the discussion's topic. And people are less likely to get off topic if they know you're gonna bring them back and keep them on time. And once they're off topic, they're less likely to keep going off topic because they know you only got so much time. And starting and ending on time helps to cultivate a safe environment for the people in your group to start to talk and share. If they know you're punctual and you're organized and you're gonna follow certain rules, such as starting on time and ending on time, people are gonna feel more safe and more comfortable starting to share their lives. So what are some tools to help you start and end on time? First thing you want to do to start and end on time is put a clock where you can see it. I am in the church house, I call it the White House, of where the church I work at, where we have a lot of small groups meet, and that is a clock right up there. And the facilitator sits right where you sit, so he can see the clock anytime he needs to. He can glance up there and look at it. Me as a facilitator, I also like to keep a clock. Oh, the only thing my watch does is tell time. Oh well, but <laughs> it tells time for me and I can easily just, you know, glance down at it and nobody knows. You know, I have my Bible in my hand and I have my Bible open and I can kind of just rotate my hand over, take a quick glance and I know what time it is and nobody else really knows that I'm looking at my clock. So to tell time, put a clock where you can see it, on your wrist or somewhere in the room. Try not to look at your phone, because if you pull your phone out and start looking at it, other people are going to want to do the same thing and just check Facebook and text messages and things like that. Another way to keep your group on time is to review what we use at our church is the covenant of love, or a lot of other churches or the curriculums have an area inside the study guide where you specifically say the start and end time. And our covenant of love at our church has that. It's the group agreement about the time you're starting and ending your group each week. That's another tool that will help you start and end on time. And you might just want to say it in your group sometimes. Hey, it's 6.30, so we're going to get started. Hey, it's 8 o'clock, so I'm going to close out our discussion, and we're going to have some time for fellowship. So a successful start small group needs punctuality. It needs to start on time and end on time, and that's something you as a small group facilitator are responsible to do.
The eighth essential strategy for facilitating a great small group discussion is to ensure that everyone in your small group understands the purpose of your group from day one. Make sure everybody understands the purpose of your group from day one of when they join. What do I mean by that? Some people really want to pray. So they come to your small group and they want to make your small group all about prayer. Some people really love fellowship and friendships. So they come to your small group. They don't want to study. They don't want to pray. They just want to have friends and talk and have a great time. Some people, they love the Bible and theology. They don't care about prayer. They don't care about talking to anybody. They just want to talk about Bible and theology and all the difficult passages in the Bible that are difficult to interpret, right? So people are naturally, they want what they want. So they're going to come to your small group and try to make your small group what they want it to be. But you as a facilitator need to make sure everybody understands the purpose of your group from day one. This is something Nehemiah struggled with in the book of Nehemiah. There's these three guys that are causing trouble to Nehemiah, Sanballat, Tobiah, and Geshem. And the rest of their enemies of Nehemiah had found out that Nehemiah finished rebuilding the wall. So they send him this letter saying, hey, we want to meet you in the Valley of Ono. Okay, Ono, it's going to be trouble. They want to meet them. But Nehemiah resends this reply. He says, I continued the work with even greater determination, Nehemiah 6, 9 says. So you as a facilitator, people are going to try to derail your group and take it off topic and make it what they want to be. But you need to make sure that they know what the purpose of your group is from day one. And how do you do that? By using the L-I-F-E, life, as part of our life group's culture at our church or whatever church you're part of might be able to help you do that. L stands for learning, instilling the word of God. And I like to talk about these four areas relating to food. We all like food and like to eat. So L is the meat. That's the learning the word of God. That's the protein and the meat and the substance part of your group. I is for including, assimilating new people into your group. This is kind of like fruits and veggies as part of the food pyramid. Some people are more sweet fruit and enjoyable to be around. Some people are more sour fruit and not as fun to be around. Some people are kind of more bland and like veggies. I'm kind of that bland person. I don't really cause a lot of sweet issues or sour issues. I just kind of go with the flow. The F is for fellowship, right? Fellowship is kind of like milk. Milk is that staple you can use in a lot of different foods and you need for a lot of different things. And fellowship needs to be part of every group. E is for equipping. This is like carbohydrates or bread. You need that energy to be equipped to go out and serve and do things. You need those carbohydrates that get turned into a glycinogen, I think, if I remember my bachelor's degree health class correctly. Glycogen maybe. But you need those carbohydrates that gives you the energy to actually go out and do things. So L-I-F-E. Learning is the meat. I for including and assimilating new people is the veggies and the fruit. F is the milk, fellowship, and then E is for equipping and that's the carbohydrates and what you need to be doing there. So the covenant of love that our groups cover is also a great way to keep people on the same page and ensure that they understand the purpose of your group from day one. Covenant of Love covers seven basic areas we want each small group to have. We want people to be faithful. We want them to be punctual on time. We want them to be edifying, open, but also confidential, gracious, and courteous. That's why we want you to be doing that Covenant of Love once a year in your group to keep people on the same page. Okay, so the eight essential strategy for facilitating a great small group is to ensure that everybody is on the same page and understands the purpose of your group from day one. The ninth essential strategy for facilitating a great discussion is to read the questions aloud before your small group meeting. I am outside now because I want to be able to talk loudly and not have to worry about it or disturbing anyone. And if you study uh, for your small group or prepare in your bedroom or somewhere around other people, you might need to get somewhere where you can read things aloud and talk aloud so that you can practice enunciating certain words because just because you read it on a piece of paper doesn't always mean you can you know say it verbally and you might need to practice that so read those questions out loud aloud so you can practice that and there's some tools if there's certain um, words that are hard to say or place names or things like that there's a book called that's easy for you to say your quick guide to pronouncing Bible names by W. Murray Severance 
produced by Broadman and Holman, um, 1997. That's something you can get, or you can play it on your phone. Uh, the passage on your phone might be able to help you. But you wanna say things aloud before you get to the meeting so that you make sure you're clear and can say things that people understand. So ninth strategy for facilitating a great discussion, practice saying the questions aloud or practice reading the passage aloud for your small group. The 10th essential strategy for facilitating a small group is to turn your phone off, okay? 10th essential strategy is to turn your phone off. I probably should have turned it off if I was gonna do this video, but oh well. Turn your phone off. And you wanna do that in a several ways. You wanna encourage, you, know, you wanna turn your, small, your phone off. As a facilitator, you need to be an example. So you just wanna do it, put it on vibrate. Or maybe as the group is starting, you might say, hey, I'm gonna turn my phone on vibrate as we begin. Just a gentle, subtle, kind way to go about it. You just pull it out, put it on vibrate, and do it. So they see you doing that. Then you want to encourage them to turn their phone off. Maybe you want to talk to your group about how this is FaceTime, okay? Different FaceTime than a phone. This is FaceTime where we're looking at each other's face. It reminds me of my wife. She'll say, let's spend some time together. I'll say, oh, let's you know go, let's watch a movie or hang out or something. She'll say, no. I want to see your eyeballs. I'm like, oh, okay, the man, you know, looking into my soul, looking at my eyeballs. But small group is FaceTime where we actually sit and look at each other and talk to each other. So that might be something you want to mention to your group. This is our FaceTime and we don't need to use phones. Another thing you want to do is encourage your people to bring a paper Bible, okay? Paper Bible can help them stay on task, limit distractions, uh, the phone, there's lots of distractions on here. There's FaceTime and you know Facebook and text messages and email and all kinds of fun apps that they can get pulled into. I was visiting one of our small groups recently that met in the morning and it's 6.15 when I'm at this small group visiting just to kind of check on the folks in it and see how it's going. And my phone buzzes at 6.15 in the morning, which is usually odd. No one usually texts that early. Um, but we were in the group talking, so I left my phone in my pocket. I didn't look at it. It just had a little buzz. And I had my paper Bible that I had brought with me, so I didn't need my phone to use to look up the passages we were talking about. But another guy or two had his phone out. And so after the group was over, I got my car and I pulled out my phone. I noticed it was one of the guys that was in that group with me. That was I was on a group text with them, and he was texting other people and taking care of some work in the middle of our group while we were talking, okay? Now, I'm sure he pulled that phone out originally to read the passages that we were talking about, but as he got a little bored or got distracted or heard, remembered he needed to do something, he hopped on there and he starts, you know, replying to the text message and I happen to be on it uh, visiting the group. So, paper Bible is a good idea. Bring it and use it and encourage your people to bring a paper Bible. And lastly, as I talk about encouraging people to turn their phones off, you wanna exercise grace in this area. Some people have elderly parents, they need to keep their phones on so they can go um, you know, be there if something happens and get the phone call. Some people might have kids that are being watched by a babysitter. They need to keep their phone on and available if something happens, and some people are just gonna forget. So exercise grace, again, this is a strategy, not a law or something you're gonna enforce, but it's just a strategy. Try to encourage your people to turn their phones off. My name is Christopher Scott. I hope this has been a helpful video for you about how you can be a better small group facilitator. 10 strategies that I am trying to help our groups use these strategies to facilitate great small group discussions to facilitate discipleship and help people grow in their walk with Christ. If you found this video helpful, you can subscribe up there and get updates on future videos. Uh, I got some other facilitator tips over there in a playlist. If you wanna learn to use a Bible study guide to take people through books of the Bible, I got the videos over there and then some other videos over there that are more topical. Thanks for watching and I hope to catch you again on another video.